Now connected is rooted in being a space that is safe and cognizant of the intersectionality of black womanhood and uplifting. My name is Sile Bolani and I'm the founder of Connected. I am also an author. I've written a book called The, uh, the Bull. <laughs> wow, forgetting the name of my own book. <laughs> oh my goodness. The book is called We Are the Ones We Need, The War on Black Professionals in Corporate South Africa. I think I just have so many platforms that I have going at the moment that my mind kind of just jumbles everything up every once in a while. Um, I also have a platform called workingwildblack.co.za, which is an online repository of information that is, you know, developed to and curated to be able to assist black professionals to better navigate to the workplace. And then I also have a podcast called The Workplace Revolution, which again supports my intention, which is to assist, enable, empower Black professionals, and particularly Black women in the workplace. Now, Connected. Connected um, is a membership-based platform, uh, which I started, and this is its first year. Um, and it is for black professional women. Through the Connected platform, I curate a year long program made up of practical workshops facilitated by black women who are experts in their fields um, with the aim of assisting uh, black professional women by developing tools and skills to navigate the workplace, to position themselves for promotions, uh, to learn the art of negotiation, understand corporate power dynamics um, and to how to use their uh, how to use those dynamics to your advantage um, we also do a lot of guided work to help break down self-limiting beliefs imposter syndrome and all the other internal barriers that we're so burdened with as the name suggests at the core of connected is the commitment to create safe spaces for black women to connect with each other and to redefine the quality of relationships they want for themselves it's a challenging process because the work that we do requires intentionality and authenticity. As we work to not only understand the barriers faced by black women, but also the layers of trauma we carry with us every day and everywhere we go, which ultimately influence our perceptions of the world and each other. When we begin to heal those traumas and evolve our perceptions, we're able to see the value in our collective and begin to show up and vouch for each other passionately because solidarity is a key step in working towards the creation of an equitable and equal world for black women. As you know, today's event is about embracing healing, being intentional about birthing new businesses and amplifying existing ones, as well as understanding how to practically create wealth Joining me for this conversation are three amazing panelists, powerful women who are blazing trails in their careers. First up, we've got Mayumi McKinley, who is a licensed psychotherapist. Uh, we've got Farisa Knox, who is a business owner and author. And we've got Rhonda, Rhonda Brunson, who is a beat credit queen. <laughs> Ladies, please would you introduce yourself to our audience and briefly share about your work and the projects uh, of interest that you may be involved in. Mayumi, let's start with you. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here, and I love what Connected is about. Um, as she stated, my name is Mayumi McKinley. I am a mental health therapist, and um, in a nutshell, I have the opportunity to assist people in healing. And I look at their, my, one of my goals is to break the negative stigmas associated with mental health, associated with therapy, especially when it comes to our community, um, because I think it's important for us to heal. To me, therapy is an opportunity to break generational cycles or generational curses, as some people refer to it. And so I love that chance, you know, that I get the chance to help women, men, families overcome some very detrimental challenges that sometimes keep us on it professionally, personal relationship wise. Um, I currently operate a outpatient mental health practice out of Los Angeles, California, and we are expanding to both Texas and um, Georgia. My goal is to expand across the world and make therapy accessible, no matter your lifestyle, you know, um, religious affiliation, who you are, where you come from, that this is something that could be accessible because all of us deserve the opportunity to heal. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Farisa. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, and I echo uh, Naomi. Thank you for having me. Um, I love how diverse all your platforms are and, and all the good all these ladies are doing. Um, so as you said, I am an entrepreneur. I have 
two businesses um, and, and I'm an author. So my businesses are wrapped up in advertising, marketing, communications, and just overall content, content creation. I have an advertising agency um, that's full service and it'll about, it's going to be 12 years old this year. Um, and we do, uh, we service clients that fall under uh, healthcare, uh, recruitment, political, um, government contracts, uh, underneath that space. So all the non-sexy stuff that I like to say is very uh, recession proof and uh, apparently global pandemic proof, uh, which is good. Uh, my other company is a production company. Um, we're the production company behind the reality show PR Girl on Amazon Prime. Um, and it just focuses on women, young women here in Chicago. And one of our cast members is out in California doing public relations and fashion, beauty and lifestyle. And just really showcasing women in a positive way in reality TV. It was really important to me to get away from the negative energy that's out there around women specific, uh, jet, really more importantly, women of color in reality and understanding that yes, when that sometimes can be entertaining, but women are multifaceted. We can also be supportive of each other. We can encourage each other and we can help each other make money and make relationships. So you get to see the, the ladies in my show do just that. So I'm really proud of that. And uh, I also uh, self-published uh, my first memoir called Love, Sex and Friendship in No Particular Order. Uh, just earlier this year. And it's the story of my 20s. I'm 39 now, but it was me kind of recanting what it was like living in New York, where I'm from, uh, getting started in advertising, meeting my then boyfriend, now husband, and just all that comes with that uh, from girlfriends and dating and all of that fun stuff. So um, again, glad to be here with everybody today. Sounds a lot like the, the, the black woman six in the city. Very exciting. Yes, that's what people say. And that was my goal for myself. I wanted to be the black Carrie Bradshaw in New York. And instead, I just wrote it all down. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Rhonda? Oh, my, my name is Rhonda, but they call me the credit queen. And for the last 16 years, I've been preaching and teaching the credit gospel to all who listen. I am the owner of Miss Brunson Credit Queen. I started uh, independently in business in 2008. Um, I also am the founder of Project Restore Be More, where our focus is slowing gentrification and allowing minorities the ability to purchase property and um, continue to plant their roots in certain areas, not just in Baltimore, but we're in DC, Virginia, Atlanta, a lot of different cities where gentrification here in Miami is taking over. Um, I do have a sales firm that allows um, other individuals to duplicate what I do in different cities as I train them and start to even transition into another area of, of business. I'm, I am almost burnt out with credit. The pandemic has been very good to me. Um, I, my business went up 80%, but it's very tiring. So um, I'm very happy to be um, invited in today. I'm new to the Connected family, so welcome me well. I don't know. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we know that Black women are largely undervalued and underpromoted and underrepresented. I mean, we've seen the statistics. In the U.S., there are currently no Black women running Fortune 500 companies. 42% um, of South Africa's total population is made up of Black women but that's not reflected in C-suites or leader, meaningful managerial positions or succession plans or leadership of listed companies or even political party leadership. Now, Mayumi, what impact does a lack of representation have on the psyche and beliefs of black women and women of color? I think that's so important. Um, just, it reminds me when I was speaking at an um, a women's conference and I had one lady come up to me and she said oh my gosh it's so good to see people like you because in school I'm currently in grad school for psychology and I don't get to see black women represented in in this field and out of my field is one of many fields where there's lack of representation and um, I think it's important in terms of letting us know that it is possible letting us know, because if you mix that, and I know you'll probably get to this along with some of the things we're told growing up, you know, you have to work twice as hard, you have to do this, you know, all these the extra pressure that's put on you, it makes it really, it can be exhausting. It could skew your perception of self. 
it can decrease motivation and drive or go in the total opposite direction where people become perfectionists or um, it can increase imposter syndrome. And I think when people like Faressa and you are, are putting things together where we can see ourselves, um, even with one young client I was working with, um, Black Panthers. So she's a young lady here from Haiti, adopted by a, um, she was adopted by a non-Black family. And her whole perception of herself changed when she watched Black Panther. She went from wanting her skin to be lighter and just not knowing what she would do to a totally different page of, I have hair like Lupita, that's me, this is beautiful. Why is your hair straight, Miss Mimi? That's what she calls me. Like, your hair, <laughs> and it just totally changed her perception of things. So I think when it comes um, to our psyche, to put in layman terms, it gives us the lack of representation can cause um, self-questioning, it could cause self-doubt, it can cause us to feel, it increases our stress level and that plays into relationships, health problems, things of that nature. And it also, it, 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 it can be defeating for young kids growing up, you know, just growing up and not being able to see that. So there's so many layers. And as, as you ask the question, I have like so many things like running through my head, how do I, I'm trying to grab on, but I think overall it becomes it starts a light, a small flame that as our experiences as women of color happen, when you have that, when you're looked over because of your race or a comment is made, it just fuels that fire. But that, 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 that fire starts when we're very young from lack of representation. So I think it can go in so many different directions and I'm just overwhelmed with joy as I hear Rhonda and you and Parisa talk about just what you all are doing because I think it breaks down that barrier and gives us an opportunity to um, rewrite our story. Absolutely. And you raise such an important point because one of the things that I actually write about in my book is how growing up as a young girl, never seeing successful black people, mm -hmm. never mind successful black women, always mm -hmm. intentionally, unintentionally led to me not even knowing what I'm supposed to study once I'm done with high school um, because I didn't have any widespread career options where I saw black women doing phenomenally. You know, we were all, I always saw black women as people who were support, you know, resources. They were never the bosses. They were never the people in the corner offices. They were never the people in the power suits. And so it kind of always then limited what I believed was possible for me, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, moving from that, um, Farisa, how much influence did this narrative have uh, when you were starting to think about, you know, starting a business? And what are some of the experiences that you've had as an entrepreneur in a historically white industry? Yeah, no, just listening to Naomi's talk, I'm like, yep, yep, yep. You know, <laughs> when, I, when I was a little girl growing up in the Bronx, my Black female aspiration was Claire Huxtable. Like, and she's not even a real you know, person, <laughs> she's a character. And that, I didn't realize so a little bit later in my life that that, what the power of, you know, what that meant to me as a kid, right? Um, that I didn't even have a real life version of a black woman to look up to, uh, knowing from a very young age, not that I wanted to be an entrepreneur or anywhere close to where I am today, but what I did know was that I wanted to be one of the best at whatever it is that I decided to do. I wanted to be known for being a professional, for being good and for being one of the best. And then hopefully inspiring others, you know, to, to be that in whatever lane that they, that they pick. Um, so I had Claire Huxable and I, I modeled the things that I did um, kind of after her in, in a way that, that, but thankfully, in not in a way that was a copycat way, right? Because even in what I do today, as I acknowledge and, and gladly take on the responsibility of being one of those faces for a lot of other young women of color, um, it's honestly one of the reasons why I wake up in the morning. Like the, this, what we all do is too hard to not have a deeper meaning and purpose, right? And so the idea that me just being who I am every day and doing what I do for a living, but allowing a spotlight to shine on me while I'm doing it, the idea that that has the ability to inspire hopefully hundreds of other Farisas, you know, who are up and coming is, you know, more than 50% of the reason why I do what I do every day. 
again, to the point, because I know what it feels like to be that little girl who doesn't, who didn't have that. Um, now I have two little girls of my own, right? And then there's, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of other, other little girls that, that need that. So yeah, it was very difficult. Um, but I thankfully had parents that never made me feel like anything was impossible. They didn't necessarily give me any guidance on how to get where I wanted to go. They just never put barriers in my way. They never made me feel like it was impossible. So I did have to go figure out how to do the things that I wanted to do. I'm still, I mean, every new phase that I enter into, new successes bring new challenges, right? So at every new phase, I'm still figuring these things out, but allowing people to watch me because we, you know, the collective we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So right. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people and particularly within, you know, the context of South Africa, we come from a, a, a historical background where black people in particular did not necessarily have access to formal employment or to formal businesses and so for a lot of my generation our generation these are people who are first generation business owners formal business owners first generation people in corporate and so it literally is <laughs> trial and error trying to figure this thing out because there's nobody there to guide us because our parents a lot of them don't know because you know they they don't have the answers either because of a lack of exposure or lack of opportunities um and you know it's a very very and that's why these types of conversations are so so important because you know there's there's such a privilege that comes from being able to learn from each other as black women because there's nobody know there's nobody who knows the black woman's experience better than a black woman awesome. um rhonda um Feelings of being undeserving generally af uh, affect the lens with which we view everything, including our finances and our belief that we can create wealth. What are some of the trends that stand out for you in terms of the relationship that Black women and women of color have with money and credit? Interesting. I was going to write a book. I'm, I'm still going to do it. And it was going to talk about, it was going to profile at how we black women treat our relationships with credit very similarly to how we treat our relationships with men. Um, credit always tells a story that you're unable to tell on your own. So we can see a lot of the behavioral stuff uh, that women go through in their credit report. Um, but, but to your question, basically when it, when it comes to what I see with the, the women that I am speaking with daily, it's just a lack of guidance. They didn't know. I encourage them to not blame their parents because credit itself is only 50 years old. If your mom's as old as my mom, she was raised kind of in the middle of it. Um, we don't often respect the relationships. We use credit and money as emotional outlets. So if we're not taking time to heal from heartbrokenness or um, abandonment from unemployment, I can see all of those behaviors in a credit report or in your bank statement. Um, there are some women that I counsel when I speak to them. I'm looking like, hey, listen, you have a Victoria's Secrets credit card. The limit is 500. Your balance is 500. It's not that many pairs of panties in the world, sis. What's going on here? And what we learn is that we hide in the mall. That's where we relieve our stress. We hide from our children in Target. We go to different places to hide out, but while we're there, we are spending because it makes us feel good. It's giving us an, a euphoric sensation because we're able to control this. So unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, but a lot of the, the counseling and stuff that I do with uh, individuals, it's about behavior, not credit. I am trying to get you to change your life and how you look at money and finances in order to go somewhere. Because a lot of times what what we want to do, what we say are our actual goals doesn't match what we deserve. We don't deserve it. If we've abused financial relationships for the last 12 months, we can't say that we deserve a $300,000 house. You don't. So we have to curb those behaviors. Uh, but number one, we do have to bring them up. I see you. I can see you. I know what you're doing here. And we need to find resources like Ms. McKinley who can work you through that mentally because it's important. Mm, Ma'am, I have a comment? May I comment? It's just something that all three of you brought up. And what I hear is um, 
when one of the questions is when trauma is passed down and how we cope is trauma, you know, trauma being passed down, whether or not you have a parent who um, allows, even if they don't know, the parent allowing you to explore. And then there are people that deal with the oppression and trauma by saying, you know, I can remember my parents that you need to get an education, right? Because education was the key. So there are lots of um, just our parents doing the best that they can and our grandparents doing the best that they can, putting limits unknown that these are still limits on how far we can grow and how, you know, how far we can go in our careers, our education or whatever it may be. So I love that this panel is bringing awareness to this because it lets us be aware of how, and I say trauma because it, it came from somewhere. If you feel like you need to ha hide in the mall or you're spending, <laughs> and, you know, whatever it is, it's unhealthy behaviors to something that has happened. And trauma doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be um, something like George Floyd, which is definitely a trauma. It could be growing up in a household with a mom who spent a whole lot of money. And so you all were always having to go eat at grandmother's house mm -hmm. or, you know, the neighbor having to drop off plates of food because the house, you know, it could be anything that's traumatic. So I just love this, that this is a discussion that's having because I'm hearing so many patterns and how patterns impact all of us as black women. Can I say one last thing? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you had, uh, Another trauma, and it, this goes with entrepreneurship and, and black women. So when you are going to work for yourself, everyone's telling you that you can't. Everybody's saying that you can't. So my mom, when I was raised, when I grew up, um, I, I'm musical. I've been singing since I was three. I studied opera and Broadway at Peabody. I was all into music. And my mom was my biggest fan. Sing anything, girl, go anywhere. As soon as I told her I was starting a business, you're going to fail. You're going to die. You're going to be broke. You want to be poor? We don't know what's, what are we going to do with you. If I was just the worst thing. Now she's back to being my biggest fan again because I was able to prove myself. But we are taught that we do need to get an education. We are taught that we need to go work for the federal government. You got to get you a good government job and commit to the system. I was totally against that, and it started young. I knew I was not. I didn't know what I was going to do, but. I knew I wasn't gonna do that. So when I told her and I made the announcement, it, she was not as supportive as she should have been. But again, her trauma comes from fear. She wasn't told anything different either. It's generational. It's the same thing with credit. People can only give you what they got. And if they don't have it, you can't expect it. And it's out of trying to protect us. And some of those tools that worked for our grandparents and our grandparents, right? And it was really effective back then. We've grown over time. So those same tools aren't always effective for us, for us now. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet now. Because <laughs> we can get on the road, can we? <laughs> I love it. I love this energy. Um, but I wanna really talk about this trauma thing, um, because this is this is a very big thing. And it's something that I've dedicated myself to this year, trying to heal my own traumas. Um, but Mayumi, coming back to you, trauma responses. What is the role that uh, trauma plays in suppressing our healing and our progression and our growth? I mean, what are, what are some of the barriers that prevent us from acknowledging also and treating our traumas? I think it's a lack of understanding. Well, one thing is a lack of understanding what healing truly is. And many of you probably have heard this. Oh, I'm not worried about that. I don't think about that. I moved on. And I tell people this, do this test. Whatever you say you've moved on from, if, if, if it doesn't, what does it bring up in you? If, you're not, if you can't have that conversation without rolling your eyes or snatching air or, <laughs> or being so frustrated, I don't care about him, you know, uh, no, no, no. There's a difference between processing hurt and avoiding it, right? There's a difference. So if I'm processing, I'm, I'm looking at how it impacted me. I'm looking at what I felt about that. I'm looking at how those feelings and it, you know, how that trauma impacts my perception of myself, my perception of the world, my perception of relationships. And I'm really diving deep into how did this one thing that happened to me impact our relationship? The easiest one, because all of us have been in relationships at one time or another in our life. After your first really heartache, I mean, it might've been in high school and you thought it was like the end of the world, right? You know, like, <laughs> like how did it impact your view of yourself? How did it impact your view of the world around you or relationships in general. So if on that scale, it impacts us, can you imagine when you don't have a mom that's in the home or a father who isn't there or abusive relationship or some type of sexual abuse? So it healing doesn't, I'm, I'm trying to put it all together. Healing means that, okay, my analogy that I give everyone, 
there is a difference. Do you all know what Neosporin is? I'm from the South, so that may be a Southern. Okay, so Neosporin is this cream that you put on wounds, but it's just meant to kind of help it heal. It, it's not anything for something that's deeply infected. So when we get a trauma, that's a deep emotional wound, right? Really, really deep. That's like needing stitches, right? Needing stitches and about When we don't heal, what we do is we put Neosporin or a little alcohol and a Band-Aid on it. So it's going to be okay for a while. You may not feel as much pain. You know it's there, but you're still able to function. But eventually the Band-Aid is going to fall off. That hurt is going to get infected. And what we do as a community, because we're taught to keep pushing, move forward, you got to be strong, is we just keep alcohol and Band-Aid. Ooh, this hurt. Alcohol and Band-Aid, divorce. Alcohol and Band-Aid, lost the job. <laughs> Alcohol and Band-Aid and went off on the boss again. Alcohol and Band-Aid now, you know. And so healing is, I'm going to take this off and this is going to hurt because this is like the, the stitches and this is painful and I'm going to have to take my antibiotics every day. And there's certain things I can't do, like drink when I take my antibiotics, but I'm going to cleanse this from the inside out. So when I'm healed, it's left a scar. And I can look at that scar and say, oh, I remember when that happened. But the intensity of it isn't, if I use a scale of one to 10, it's not all the way at a 10, if that makes sense. That was so dope. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for so dope. Yeah. Because that's what we do, right? You know, and that right now, and I, I would have added just George Floyd to that list, right? Of like divorce, this, blah, blah, blah. It's like, we all need to be able to heal from the wounds that have happened to us throughout our entire lives as individuals, but also as a collective, you know, community of like just the Black diaspora on the globe. We've been treated not not well not well at all and we all deserve to be able to take a minute and heal from that well culturally we've been taught to push through but we haven't been taught how to heal mm -hmm. and so that's the we know how to stuff something and go to work right mm -hmm. in the united states well we had three hang three black men i think four black men hung from trees and everybody got up and went to work the next day how many people have talked about how that makes them feel when they have brothers fathers sons and we just know to push forward but we don't know how to stop and process and I'm hoping that platforms like this allow us to I mean look how beautiful black women and you just stated that you are working on your trauma and this is how far we can come maybe not even scratching the surface so imagine if we started to peel back those layers as individual women or as a community how much further we would get mm -hmm. and I think it really does can go back back to back being able okay, to, to, to embrace pain as part of the process yeah. there's been so much shame that we've attached to feeling you know everybody wants to be unbothered everybody wants to be unaffected everybody doesn't want to care so what whatever <laughs> you know that's become the culture mm -hmm. um because we just are too afraid to actually just allow ourselves to sit in our feelings and to look at them and to acknowledge them and to process them so that we're able to release that pain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you some of that is because financially you don't have time. So I can't I can't go through a breakup and miss work. Nobody cares that I, I went through a breakup. My business partner was killed in Baltimore in 2015 on January the 29th. I was back to work January 30th. Nobody cares that you're going through through whatever it is. Now you care. I, I mean, that was the worst year. I went through so much because I wasn't dealing with anything. I wasn't grieving. I was in this motion like I have all of these people that I'm responsible for who don't care about my problems. So I can't, I can't, I, you don't normally get time to really deal with trauma, not the appropriate amount of time that you would really need to sit with yourself. So mm -hmm. I think that that would be where we need to learn. How do we create time to heal from trauma and still work and be mothers and be sisters and be friends? Because at the end of the day, people dump a lot on you too of their trauma. And you're dealing with all of this. And if you're an empath, you know, it is heavy. Heavy is the crown. It's hard to shape that. Absolutely. It is hard. And I think it starts with us starting to change our perception of taking care of ourselves. Because you said, I don't have time. And you gave me a list of things that are, and they are important. I agree with you. And I think we have to slowly shift our mental health as becoming just as important as our kids, just as important as our job. And I, we all can't take a month off work. And the time you need to heal, you know, to heal, healing is subjective. It's to each person. There's no timeline on the three days. And here we get what, three days for bereavement? Who really gets over the death of someone who's been in their life in three days? It doesn't happen. But if we make it a priority, it may not look like a 24-hour day. It may look like 10 minutes in the shower with me meditating. 
It may look like when I'm actually sitting and having my coffee, I'm sitting and having my coffee. I'm not going through the laundry list of things in my head. It's me taking time to go to therapy, the same time I would take to go to my OBGYN, the same time I would take to go to my dentist, the same time I would take to go to my eye doctor, making that therapy appointment so that I have 45 minutes to an hour of undisturbed time to focus on me. So I think we slowly have to shift it and recognize that it doesn't have to be all or nothing that there's this gray area in between that if we think of our mental health and our emotional health, I call it an emotional bank account, as if we throw some deposits in there, every once, you may have a quarter here, some days you may be making a big deposit, then you make a withdrawal. But what we do is we throw pennies and we don't make any deposits and we're consistently withdrawing. And then we're like, why well, I have high blood pressure? Why am I getting these migraines? Why am I overweight? You know, why am I this? Why am I, why am I going off on my kids? Not realizing it's because our emotional account is depleted. So thank you so much for Ron, because I think those are very real things and it's not an easy answer. But I think if we start to set our mindset to say, like, just like when I'm working, when we're on this conference call, I don't know if you have other people in your house. I'm like, I'm on this call. Don't, don't come in the room. Like, right. I made it a priority. I have to make my mental health a priority as well. And what that looks like within the context of my home may differ. Absolutely. Let me I tell you what I've done for me. To highlight that it's not, okay. the, the process of healing is not one big thing. You know, it's little little small decisions that we make, you know, little, uh, you know, changes that we, we add to our, uh, our daily lives. I think that is the key really. Mm -hmm. yeah. But speaking about grief, um, I mean, we've all been watching what's been happening in the United States. You know, we've been watching, you know, all of the Black Lives Matter protests and all of the issues around police brutality. And, you know, we don't, really spend a lot of time talking about the impact that grief has on, on, on black people who are still obviously expected to show up as their full selves, well, mm -hmm. the acceptable version of themselves mm -hmm. at work, right? So you go into your, your, your workplace um, after such a painful experience, witnessing such a painful um, situation, um, and you're walking into a workplace that does not acknowledge the fact that, for instance, George Floyd was just murdered by the police. Um, they don't acknowledge the trauma that black people across the country have been ex are experiencing at that moment um, and acting as though it's business as usual. Now, in situations like that, how do we as black people and black women take care of ourselves when we're going into a space that is completely ignoring and not acknowledging what we're actually living through at that particular time. That's uh, it. Go ahead, who go ahead. Is that for? Is it for, um, I have some thoughts just of stuff that I've done, you know, in my business and things that I'm encouraging people to do. So um, first thing I'll say is it's a, it's a privilege, you know, for me to own my own business and, and then therefore, um, the employees that I have to come to work every day at a in an environment that's run by a black woman is a very different environment that then you know most people have the luxury of coming to work to every day. Um, so we've built in things in our in our system that allows for these types of conversations that we're having right now within the workspace. You know, with all of us still basically working remotely. Um, we have a weekly standing appointment where it's just, we're all logging into Google or Zoom and just talking about what's going on and how we feel about it. And as a mixed race and sexual oriented and, and everything type of um, workplace, how it's affecting all of those different groups and, you know, and letting other folks who aren't black, you know, share their thoughts, their fears, their question marks, right? Because they have a lot of questions and, um, you know, just not everyone is, is understanding, right? Like they, they think, they think differently, but for the folks who don't have the luxury of going to work where you're, you know, it's either an open environment for these types of conversations or it is black run. So therefore, you know, there's no ignoring this level of conversation. Um, I would encourage people to speak up. Um, I'm excited by this level of energy that I'm starting to see here um, in the States and on national television and a lot of stuff where black people and people of color who have typically had to toe this line of, let me just be nice enough so that like, I don't offend white people with the truth and like what really is going on from our perspective. 
we have let that go. Like I have seen that happening more and more. And I would encourage people to have that mindset of tell the truth. If it is hard for you to come to work every day because your boss or your leaders or your management have not allowed for the conversation around what it feels like to be black in America or black on this globe today, then say that, say that and be willing to live with any of the consequences. And I'm not encouraging people to be disrespectful to their bosses or their managers or anything. It's just about being honest and truthful. Something that we didn't feel like we had the luxury to do in the past. And I am seeing it happening more and more and I am, I'm excited by it and I'm personally encouraged by it. And I would tell people, just tell the truth, tell the truth. I would say tell the truth, but also do your part. So um, when every, I've, I've been part of a black movement since I've been black. I want black people to win everywhere. So when I talk to people who work in corporate environments, especially for the federal government, it is very staunch. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm only going to go to work. If someone asks me about it, I'm going to ignore the conversation. So a friend of mine and I got into it. What are you going to do? If they're not going to bring the conversation to you, how do you start it amongst your peers? Or what is your role going to be? If you're telling me as a black male engineer, how difficult it's been for you to succeed in the federal government, to me, it is your duty to become a part of the recruitment team that brings in other black male and female engineers. So even if you don't have the conversation directly, you can promote change indirectly just by doing something. But what you can't do, what you're not allowed to do is to ignore. It's everyone's responsibility to reach back and lift up. If you miss that part, then you're missing your whole existence as a human. That's what we're supposed to be doing, elevating someone else. So I think you should definitely tell the truth, but you should also find out what your role is in this. How am I going to create effective change in this environment so that people who look like me can still win? Absolutely. And I agree with the both of you. Um, so I'd add on to what both of you are saying. And I, I, I'm glad that Rhonda kind of balanced it out because some people in corporate America, if I'm a mother of five and I'm working in corporate America and my salary is what's funding my home and we know in certain environments, it's very rigid. Um, I was going to say, find a way for you that you can still advocate. So whether she said like is reaching back or getting on the recruitment team, or you develop your own um, Facebook closed group on how to deal with stress in the workplace, find what you can do um, to, 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 to be your release, you know, to be your release for it and speak up, find right now, especially with the Black Lives Matter move, there are so many platforms, forums, blogs, communities that you can become a part of that can be an outlet for you. But taking care of your emotional health is, is, is equally as important. I was trying to jot down some notes when she said, um, how do you cope in the workplace? Another thought is don't feel the need to defend all the time. And I say this why, and you all may or may not agree with this. Um, I think it's important for us to speak up. I think it's important for us to share thoughts and um, provide clarification, um, you know, clear up some misunderstandings, educate those things. However, for those who feel like it's their responsibility every single day, all day, it could be very exhausting for them in the workplace. And now the workplace becomes a place of tension. And, you know, so find your, I say, find your platforms across the board. By all means, I'm not saying sit and be quiet and let people walk over you. Uh, but find that balance between choosing your energy from the conversations that you want to put your energy in and educate. And then the conversations where you know people are just pushing your buttons or you know, preserve your energy across the board. Maybe find another outlet, like Rhonda said, in terms of being a part of the team to have diversity and inclusion meetings, you know, being an active um, force on those um, on those meetings. Um, so I think it's a very difficult, and I, I can remember situations I've been, it's a very difficult place to be, but I think if we start speaking up and we start recognizing it, and it's not just a conversation on your way home from work about how people are getting on your nerves, if it becomes a movement, if it becomes, you know, you join a group, you become, you learn the human resources, you team up with lawyers and see what's right and what's not right, then it can be something that's active change and it won't be just us talking about a problem that's consistently happening and we're all experiencing. Does that, does that make sense, Kevin? Absolutely. I completely I agree. I have a question. Uh, yep. Yeah. Has anyone, um, and this is for, and I guess people can respond in the chat as well. Um, I know a lot of my friends were receiving messages from people who are not of color, apologizing because now they are aware. And I think that it's important that instead of us getting offended because they didn't know, we have to understand that they are taught history 
a totally different way. So it, we, because we're connected to our families and our families have passed down honesty to us that we were slaves, we were not indentured servants, we were not asked to come, we were stolen. You know, um, their understanding is different. So be empathetic to them too, as they try to apologize and navigate through their own feelings. No, we don't have to answer every question and be the token brown person in the room all the time, but just try to understand also that they were taught something a little bit different, which has skewed their, their view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I'd add to this, someone just made a comment. I feel like you can't stand your truth and be treated the same. I, I think you have to really think about what is your reason for telling your truth? Because when I tell my truth, it's for me. It's not for me to have any expectation that you're going to treat me different. It will be great. Don't get me wrong. You know, if this, if I explain what is my experience and someone came like, wow, and they really came from a place of compassion and understanding, that would be great. But even in our personal relationships, when we take the time to speak our truth, I do it for me so I don't have to carry that baggage. So I don't have to carry the discomfort of certain conversations. So I don't have to carry discomfort of you asking me a question about my hair, about this or about that. And I'm dealing with that discomfort. It's, I'm going to clear my space so that I have energy for other things and I'm going to do it out of love out of compassion like um, Rhonda said um, but if you choose to treat me differently because of my truth that's more of your issue and not mine and I truly have to view it that way now hopefully you know there's always an exception to a rule you know there are people who make can make the workplace a living hell and I can understand that and you have to go different avenues but speaking in general when you choose to tell your truth make sure you're doing it for you and not with the agenda of I'm going to tell them this and then they'll get it and then I'm going to be treated differently or I'm going to tell them this and they're going to get it and it's going to change their perception and now the work environment is going to be totally different because we can't control another human being but I do have control over my truth. Absolutely but I also think it speaks to the importance of being able to establish meaningful creations, I mean, creations, connections um, mm -hmm. amongst ourselves within the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because one person trying to speak up is very different to a group of people speaking up. The response from an organization will be completely different. And finding your tribe within your organization or within the workplace is critically important because there's power in numbers. And this is something that I'm always stressing. No, no one person can change an environment, but a group of people who have a common cause and who are equally committed to that cause, you know, will be able to create far greater change than just one person trying to be on a one man warrior mission. Now, that means on the business we have to break. Uh, can I add one more thing? That means we have to break when we talk about generational cycles, because what we, what are we taught as black women, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, there's this, a lot of times it's pulling down this competition, this, especially if you're one of maybe few African and so that means we have to challenge our, that subconscious view of self, that subconscious um, competition factor and really come together and support one another. Mm, absolutely. Now on the business side of things, um, Farisa, now for, for black women in particular, I mean, there's a certain level of audacity that you need to have to be able to be determined about starting and sustaining your own business um, because we're changing narratives, you know, we're overcoming lots of fears. Um, and, and, you know, one of those things is around, you know, what is your, what is your worth? You know, how do you charge, <laughs> you know, um, how do you negotiate uh, when you are interacting with clients? What are some of the core principles that you believe have helped you create and sustain a successful and thriving business? Yeah. Um... I think one of the most important things for me has always been I never I never believed well that's I be, I didn't believe all of the lies right so starting out you know like we've been talking about you know black women are lied to a lot mm -hmm. we are told things that are just not true and as it pertains to business that you know here is what a successful business person looks like right and it doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like you guys, right? But I never, I never believed that. Um, I always had a really great sense of self worth and value in what I could accomplish. And if I could bet on anything or anyone, I was gonna always bet on myself. And I still kind of lead with that. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't real obstacles in front of us as Black women as we navigate our professional lives and specifically as it pertains to starting and growing businesses. But what I started to do was test the thought process of, do I believe this because it's real or do I believe this because someone told me it was real? 
So I like to use the analogy of like a brick wall where sometimes when you're a business owner, it feels like you are standing in front of a brick wall and there's no way around it, over it, through it. Um, but if you tell your mind, it's not a wall, it's a door that you can open, right? Or it's something that you, if you just walk through it, you, it will allow you to keep walking, right? It looks like a wall, but it's not actually a wall. Um, as soon as I started to think in that way, the brick walls actually turned into curtains that, okay, yeah, you got to do this when you walk through a curtain, but you can still get through that curtain, right? So I think it's like, and, and I think, Naomi, you just kind of touched on this. It's changing our mindset around how we think about things, and it really has to start there. Um, the real obstacles then uh, at, underneath that come from just lack of knowledge, lack of experience, lack of exposure. So I don't come from a line of business owners. Like my parents, you know, my dad's an immigrant from the Caribbean, my mom's from Harlem. And, you know, my grandma was an alcoholic. And, you know, from there, we're listed as Negro one and Negro two, you know, there's, I don't come from, from, from this lineage. I created this opportunity for myself. So I'm figuring out, I'm figuring it all out along the way, but I'm also not treating that process as something less than. It is still as valuable because when you really believe that your presence in a room brings thoughts, um, ideas, and ways of doing and thinking that are unique to you, then you now know your self-worth to your question around what's my worth, what's my value. It's as equal as that white man standing next to me because I bring something totally different to the table than he, that he's incapable of bringing. And when you really believe that and can articulate it and then in the spaces that you're in actually add value, right? In my case, from a business leadership perspective, from an advertising perspective, from a content creation perspective, then, you know, your voice is heard. But I think it, it starts internally. We have to really believe that we are valuable. We have to believe that what we bring to the table is just as valuable. And I would argue right now, probably more valuable because we've been muted. So, you know, that's how I, that's how I think through my daily life as it pertains to what's my value. Mm -hmm. Can I answer that? Yeah. I think that what, what has helped with my overall brand is the level of consistency that I've shown. Um, sometimes you see people jump in and out of industries because it wasn't working for them or they were in it for the wrong reason. So I'm going to go sell hair. When that flops, I'm going to go sell coffee. When that flops, I'm going to go sell tea. When that flops, you know, and because you're not really consistent and dedicated to even your idea of whatever your business is, it doesn't work. So when you go to set value and you want to charge $1,000, people may not want to pay you because you've been all over the place. Like Marissa said, we have, um, we've been lied to from the beginning. So when it comes to business, we don't even structure business the way that it's supposed to be structured from the beginning. It starts out like our little secret. So my business is technically my baby. That's why I'm so stressed out all the time. This is my kid. It's the only one I got. And I protect it at all costs, but it wasn't because of a business loan that I started. I started every company with nothing. I'm doing really well, but I'm doing well because of consistency and because I never believed in the word no. I know I'm an only child, only grandchild. No does not exist. We're going to find a way to get it done. So I think that if you have that type of determination, you're going to continue to go anyway, but you must remain consistent. Absolutely. I, um, oh, yeah. What I would add to that, one, and once again, I'm similar to, I'm the first person in my, in my immediate family to start a business. So you don't have a book, you don't know how, you just know this is what I want to do. And when you look at failure as an opportunity to learn, that's what I, you know, as opposed to, okay, I'm not supposed to be doing this when we believe in ourselves. And I love what you said for us about um, knowing that we're supposed to be in the room, because how many of us have been in a room and it's just like, oh, I'm so lucky to be here. You know, or, oh, oh, you know, or I'm not supposed to be here. And it's like, no, I'm supposed to be here. I'm here for a reason, no matter if I'm lucky to have us. That, thank you. That, that's that unspoken, that unspoken rule that's been passed down, right? Um, I like the consistency part. And I, I wrote my notes down and I scribbled it so much I can't even understand what I wrote. But... <laughs> 
You know, you said, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you said something, um, you said that being consistent um, is also important. It's going to come back to me. It'll come back to me. That was, yeah, Rhonda, Rhonda was talking about consistency mm -hmm. and not going back and forth. Different. You know, oh, different yes. Ideas. Yeah. I was saying passion. Most of our people are chasing money. Because in our communities, we, we're like, I don't want to be like this. I want to strive. And so when we chase the money, my mentor told me a long time ago, do your passion, find your purpose, and the money will come. Sure. And I think that we really focus on that. Like, really, what is your, all of us have got gifts. We have gifts, talents, wherever you, whatever your belief system is. So we all have gifts that are, my gift is not like Rhonda's gift. It's not like Parissa's gift. It's not like, your, like all of us are different, right? And so when I focus on my purpose and my gift, my success is inevitable. But when you talk about people, have, you know, jack of what is a jack of all trades, master of none, it's right. because what we're chasing is not, is not, it's not in, within our purpose. So now the coffee's gone, so I'm gonna go to hair and the hair's gone, so I'm gonna go to shoes and then I'm gonna try to be an Instagram model and then I'm gonna try to do this versus finding my gift, focusing on me. But we're not taught to do that culture. We're not taught to focus on me. We're taught to go out and make some money because you gotta take care, which is true, but where is that part of you? Where is that self-discovery? And a lot of, um, in our culture, a lot of dreams are squashed because it's not education. Our parents want us to do something that's guaranteed and we live in an environment where entrepreneurship now is, there's so many things you can do if you're consistent and you find a mentor and um, things of that nature. So yeah, I would encourage people to look at yourself and try to find your purpose and your passion because then success is inevitable, whatever you do. Absolutely. Now, Rhonda, for a lot of Black people um, in a lot of Black communities, when we speak about wealth, um, the association that we have as white people, we understand the concept of generational wealth when we're speaking about white people, but we don't necessarily bring it back home and try to learn, figure out, understand what that means for us, um, because obviously that's not part of our history as black people. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how can people who aren't wealthy, who don't come from wealthy backgrounds approach wealth creation? What are some practical tips and financial vehicles that people can explore if they are looking to start creating wealth? If we want to be wealthy, our desire to save has to be greater than our desire to spend. If we, wealthy people, I write this book, I cannot remember the name of it, but it was all about what, what wealthy people do versus what like technically hood rich people do. So a wealthy person is going to wear pretty much the same uniform every day, a polo shirt and a khaki pair of pants. A not wealthy person who wants to look rich will spend all of their money in Gucci, Louis, you know, trying to have the latest trends because how they look is more important to them than what they're creating. Um, our desires would then have to change. It goes back to passion. If, I, if I'm trying to leave some type of legacy to my family, then I know that all of this blood, sweat, and tear stuff I have going on right now is worth it. And I'm not going to throw my hands up and say, I quit. I'm tired. Leave me alone because I'm, I have a greater purpose. So you can always introduce generational wealth. One way, and this is going to sound so morbid and crazy, is life insurance. So many of us don't have it. But imagine if, if I passed away, my mom technically would change a whole new pay grade because I have so much life insurance to cover me and my business. That's a way that people can get wealth almost immediately. Um, land acquisition. I learned that my, my family owns land that's, that used to belong to slaves. So now we have land in our family and we, we can grow and develop on that. But it's having those conversations. I think also um, a lot of millennials are disconnected when it comes to older generations. So I'm very close to my 94-year-old aunt and my 83-year-old grandmother. So we can have conversations and I'll ask them, hey, how much, what's the most you ever paid for a pair of shoes? And they'll say $55 and I fall on the floor because I can't imagine that being the most. Um, or when I look up their land records for the houses that they bought in the 80s and they paid them off in three years and they've never refinanced the mortgage. You know what I mean? So when they sell their homes, my aunt is walking away with a check for 289000 that she only spent 30000 on in the first place. That's wealth. That's what that looks like. But if you're not tuned into your own family, because some of us do have that, but we're so busy focused on the wrong reality shows that we are thinking that that is what wealth looks like. We're not looking at the rich people in our family that, that look poor because to us, they haven't shown us yet what it looks like to be rich. I don't know. I think it just comes with changing your vision.